All right, had a little bit of a glitch there. Had a little bit of a glitch, that's okay. You wanna know why? Cause I'm rocking out, I'm all laid back right now. And why? It's the 4th of July. Totally true, 4th of July, happy 4th of July, and what a better way to celebrate it than right here with your boy, the Kaiser, the Paleocrat, on Paleocrat Diaries. Come on now! We're gonna rock out. We're gonna be super psyched, and why? Cause it is the day and the night that the Lord has made. We're rejoicing every day, we're glad in it, in fact. Super, super psyched out of our minds right now. Do you hear all of the sounds going on around me? If you do, it's because there's fireworks. You know they're setting it off for you, boy. <laughs> they're like, the Kaiser's on! It's true, it's true. And we're gonna be having a great show for you today. We're gonna answer some questions. It might be a little bit more chill. We're gonna be talking about nihilism. We are, we are. We're gonna be talking about the nihilism of destruction. What is its theology? Just how, it, how satanic is its spirituality because atheism is an abyss. It's annihilation. It's what it is. There, it is set on rebellion. It is set on resistance, right? Loathing, in fact, those institutions that are rooted organically in this world that reflect, right? The ideas of God in this world in proper order. So we're gonna take it down. <laughs> Come on! I hope you got your, your coffee ready. Hope you got your booze. In fact, I'm gonna be opening up some cracking. <laughs> I hope Locke is down with this. I hope he's okay, right? Not gonna get sloshed, <laughs> obviously. Obviously. But you know what? We gotta resolve right now. I hope you did earlier. I hope you took a knee for Christ the King because it's what we do here every day. Committing deep inside to never give up keep on smiling and to remember that we too one day we're gonna die so we gotta we gotta dream those bigger thoughts like right now we have to commit every single thought every single deed all of our actions to the divine constitution of the visible church because christ is king right now <laughs> christ is king right now all right we're gonna go to the comments here in a moment but before we do i just want to give a, a quick shout out over at uh saint maker here, let me let me add this real quick. Let me let me go ahead and at least get this up here. There we go. Uh, oops, wrong one. Oops, my bad. There we go. There we go. So okay. So before we do, quick note about Saint Maker. For one, thank you to all of those who have been purchasing the Saint Maker. Totally awesome. Uh, very grateful for that. But I want to uh, extend something to you again. Okay, and that is that if you got the Saint Maker. And you're looking at it and you're going, holy cow, this is a serious, serious deal. This is a lot of stuff. How do I do this? Believe me, you are, in fact, not alone. And that's why I would like to personally say, I'd like to connect with you. And you can do that by joining us on Telegram. The link for that is in the description below. It's easy. It's T, the letter T, dot me, slash the Wolfpack chat. And your boy is at Jeremiah Bannister, my personal channel there is at Paleocrat. All of that is very easy to find, of course. Uh, but you can connect with me there. I'd like to set up a group where people who are, are going through the same maker, they can go through it together, and we can assist each other, in fact, in, our, in this path, this awesome path. And we're going to learn more about that. When we get back, we're going to dive right in. I've already got some questions in the chat. Oh, oh, I almost forgot about something. <laughs> I almost forgot. I can't, I can't forget. I can't forget, if I don't do it right now, I'm going to maybe possibly, it's it's possible. Right? I'm a little flighty, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> little, little eatsy bit, little eatsy bit. But I have to say, uh, I have to say real quick, happy birthday, a huge shout out to, to my Oregonian buddy, right? My buddy and my pal. Uh, today is his birthday. I'm, I'm trying to find out, just to remember if he gave me how old he is. Yeah, let's see here. Oh, Where do, oh, my wife sent it to me. Okay, I got you. I got you. My, my wife keeps me good. Kaiser, Jeremiah, if I can get a birthday shout out, I will donate some birthday money to the Patreon. Don't tell Luther. This is basically Simon. Okay, so I didn't care. Just you saying it's your birthday. I felt badly because I forgot to announce my boy David's birthday. My buddy David, Pax Domini, forgot to mention his birthday. And so we are really, really grateful for you. We're grateful for, for you being part of the group, for being part of the pack. Uh, we really do mean it when we say that we're better because you're here. And so I just want to thank you for that real quick before we move on. We'll go ahead and go to the same maker ad if you've already seen it, if you've already bought it. 
you can go ahead and grab that, grab that coffee, grab that juice, grab that pop, grab whatever you got, because we're going to be entering the octagon of human history talking about nihilism in about, brr, I don't know, 90 seconds. Can a personal planner really make you a saint? Not by itself. But in our day and age of addictive apps and glowing screens, we're bombarded by constant distraction. And our quest for sainthood often takes a backseat. The Saint Maker is the first high performance planner for the spiritual life made by faithful Catholics for faithful Catholics. It's a work of genius, really, fusing the wisdom of the saints with the science of personal productivity. It's rigorous, but sainthood is tough, and most of us need help organizing our time, our work, our leisure, and our devotion, because that can help you become a saint. The Saint Maker is elegant, fits in your purse or briefcase, and is a perfect companion for your missal, Bible, or rosary. Published four times per year, each season includes daily planning pages, feast days, and devotions for both forms of the liturgical calendar, goal-setting pages, confession journals, and more. It's why the Saint Maker is used by hardworking Catholics like CEO of Sock Religious Scott Williams, best-selling author Sam Guzman, YouTubers like Amber Schneider, a Catholic wife Dina Barca, and Brian Holdsworth, and priests like Father Corey Stitcher. Try the Saint Maker out, and if you decide that it's not for you, you can send it back for a full refund within 90 days. So go right now. Find your life planner at thesaintmaker.com. Quantities are limited, though, so head on over to thesaintmaker.com to order yours and to start your Saint Maker journey today. You got to do it. Saintmaker.com slash Pillagrad Diaries info and promo code in the description below. Right there, of course, is the alert system. If you are not familiar with how things roll here, that is your cue to go as fast as you can and get any instrument of any kind that you can beat as fast and as hard as you possibly can <laughs> to let the world know all the people in the north, in the south, in the east, in the west, the Paleocrat Diaries is on the air. And we're going to be talking today about nihilism, the root of the revolution of the modern age by Eugene, Father Sarah from Rose. We are talking the end of chapter two, beginning of chapter three. We're gonna talk about the nihilism of destruction. We've talked about the dialectic and we're leading now to the end game. And what is it? Ah, complete destruction. <laughs> complete destruction. Atheism is a system and it's wicked bad. It's, anni it's an annihilating force, dragging us down into the darkness, into that pit of nothing, right? But they can't get away from the fact that they're creatures. They are creatures created in the image of God and they live and move and have their being in his created order and one that we know why, because of the Trinity. And I'll address that here in just a moment. There's a great article, in fact, there's a great article. You can find it over at, what is it? Church Life Journal, exploring the porous boundaries between theology and philosophy. It's by Paul Rojek. Totally amazing, talks about this. I'm late to the game, in fact. <laughs> They've already been talking about it. And more than that, a whole bunch of different folks listed in this that are hearkening back to, you know, the patristics. The patristics, it's old school. It's old school. It's about relation. It's revolutionary, in fact. We're just a mouthpiece. I'm learning more and more and more. This is, we are the, the new Bonaventurians. It's what we are. We're the new Bonaventurians and we're on the rise. Copleston didn't think we'd come back, but we will. So grab that trumpet, grab that kazoo, grab the xylophone, those Marlboro cigarettes. <laughs> All of those carrier pigeons all around the world letting your friends, family, classmates, and coworkers know that you can, you can turn back the tide on nihilism. You can turn back the tide on atheism and secularism. That wicked, nasty humanism detached completely from God. A Star Trek LARP, a Star Wars LARP, <laughs> a LARP no matter what that is literally wreaking havoc on civilizations, institutions all around the world all around the world but not for long it's true because christ is king all power right now totally totally true all right in the comment section in the comment section let's get over here let's get over here. here we go so okay uh yeah right up here late night july 4th stream count me in dude i almost wore my my sombrero almost I was thinking about. I still have it. I might. I might throw that bugger on here at some point. It's just possible. <laughs> it's possible. Let's see. Finally, I'm able to watch one of these live. Joel Montero. Yes, man. Yes. Kaiser said he was going to be on time, but who knows when that is, bro? I am like my my. I'm, I'm wherever I go. 
right? I have this this thing about me where wherever I go, the right time is the time that it is for me at the moment. <laughs> Kaiser Standard Time. That's what it is. It's Kaiser Standard Time. Yes, and uh, I was early for the Fat Shame to Fitness. And if you're not in that yet, I don't know if you've noticed, right? My, my face no longer looks like, you know, kind of a bulldog. With jowls dangling down like this. <laughs> Not doing that anymore. Sick and tired of that. I'm wearing shirts that I haven't worn in years. I'm wearing pants that I haven't worn in years. And I'm keeping it simple. ABCs and one, two, threes. A fat shame to fitness. You eat when you're hungry. You only eat till you're full. You eat whatever you want. And if you're ever distracted and you're like, I'm, I'm pulled in by the tractor beam of the refrigerator and I don't know why. <laughs> I'm not hungry, but I'm finding myself in the pantry staring at a bag of Doritos. That is the old ding dong from heaven to let you know that you are supposed to pray. So yes, very, very good. If you're not part of that, it's a private group. Make sure to hop on Telegram or you can reach out to me in Gmail. I kind of hate that. I will hold it against you forever <laughs> if you do that to me. So don't do that. Just go to Telegram, you weirdos. You got to do it. It's awesome, by the way. Live streams every day. Every single day we have live chats. We have live streams on different different channels that are connected with us. Prayer chain that prays every day for the intentions of the Wolfpack. Every single day. Raising up your names and your intentions to the Lord. You got to do it. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. We even have an all, all ladies chat. We now have the all men buffalo chat. <laughs> it's awesome. It's like a mini mall over there. And I'm the bowels. Let's see, Palocrat, hi. You say that we can explain the problem of the one and the many because God is a trinity. Can you explain how does the trinity, how can it account for the one and the many? I want you to ask that question again for a second and say, what do you believe about the trinity? What can we know about the trinity, right? In its, in its oneness and in its relatedness in its persons and the roles that they play and ask the relatedness. In fact, I encourage you, right? I strongly encourage you to go, in fact, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll leave up this chat for a second. Doesn't the fact that we cannot understand the Trinity's essence, that this would be in conflict with our affirmation, if you were, if you were the kind of person who denied the import of revelation um, in your worldview, maybe, <laughs> but not us, not us. Um, and so we can, we can say an awful lot about God's unity, as well as the idea of persons, right? And the relationship between them. And so... As I said, this article here, um, and that in the in our worldview, that the created order reflects this, right? So if you deny revelation, yeah, sure. If you don't, and you have the worldview that we're talking about, and not an isolated, isolated, isolated thing detached as if that's even possible. Um, if you if you have that, you know, <laughs> you're going to be in a bind, no matter no matter what, no matter what. Um, but right here, okay. So it's talking about metaphysics and the Trinity or metaphysics of the Trinity and Trini uh, Trinitarian ontology, okay? Now, just, just listen to this. This Again, this is uh, Paul Rojek, uh, Church Life Journal, a journal of the McGrath Institute of, uh, uh, for Church Life. Right here, Therefore, the relationship between dogmatics and metaphysics comprises two fundamental, though not always clearly distinguished aspects. Uh, in the encyclical Fide et Ratio, John Paul II uh, wrote that speculative dogmatic theology presupposes and implies philosophy of the human being, the world, and more, radical, uh, more radically of being. On the other hand, dogmatics always presupposes a certain metaphysics because to formulate the statements, it uses concepts that are derived from philosophy. On the other hand, dogmatics also implies a certain metaphysic because modifying the existing philosophical concepts, it indicates and inspires some philosophical solutions. The teaching on the Holy Trinity illustrates this very well. Trinitarian dogma uses concepts that list a number of them. Uh, and then it says, on the other hand, the Trinitarian dogma, which comes from the revelation, is expressed in philosophical terms and becomes the source of philosophy. So you have this interplay the entire time. This interplay, and it was talking about the difficulty, the weirdness, in fact, of the metaphysics of the Trinity and Trinitarian ontology developed almost totally independent of each other until... Recently, okay? So until recently, and this is one of these things, you know, you stumble out kind of like, kind of like there's another article over there on um, uh, Divine Illumination and Bonaventure. Absolutely amazing. You want to talk, we, and we're not even joking when we say we're the new Bonaventurians. It's totally true. We're bringing it back. Copleston said that he did not imagine that it would ever make a revival, that it would never find its way back, and I would like to beg to differ 
of course, no disrespect, right? I, he's a brilliant, brilliant guy. W was a brilliant guy. Lo love the, the books. I'm studying the, his books on philosophy, his five-volume uh, five set. So really happy about that. Grateful to Jake Fowler, also, of Paleocrat Diaries. He picked up uh, part five. Okay, so very, very happy. If I, yeah, very happy about that. Super exciting. Let's see here. So the, uh, talking about uh, Joseph Ratzinger wrote in his Introduction to Christianity, the sole dominion of thinking in terms of substance is ended. Relation is discovered as an equally valid primordial mode of reality. It becomes possible to surmount what we today call objectifying thought. A new plane of being comes into view. Okay. So then he's talking about the uh, uh, Klaus uh, Hemmerl, Bishop of is it Aachen, right? A E or A A C H E N, one of the founders of the Focolare movement, published a short text called Theses Toward a Trinitarian Ontology, became a program of a whole approach developing the idea of a new ontology inspired, in fact, by the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, and, and incorporating many different schools of thought into that as well. So, but I wanted to specifically talk here, the proprium of Christian life is love expressed in the Trinitarian dogma. Therefore, Trinitarian ontology must break with the traditional primacy of a substance and recognize the primacy of a relation. In the Trinitarian ontology, what becomes central is movement, no longer understood in Aristotelian terms, and relation, likewise no understood, not understood, as a category or even as the accident weakest in being. But he goes further and says that uh, we would be able to know the created order, in fact, because of this. Okay, right here, let's see. Uh, he's talking about Coda, Pierre Alcoda, uh, was the rector of the Institute, um, talking about, where is this? The um, University Institute Sophia in La Piano. Okay, so you got Pierre Alcoda. Says, as far as I know, Coda is the only official professor of Trinitarian ontology in the world. He's also the author of numerous theological works concerning the Trinity, as well as of many important texts dedicated to Trinitarian ontology. Coda defines Trinitarian ontology simply as the view of the world from the point of view of the Trinity. He explains that the word ontology means giving a word to being, i.e., to the reality in which we, li we, we are to live and meet. And the word Trinitarian is related to, quote, light from which, uh, from which and in which we can see, interpret, and live in that reality. So again, we're talking about not just the oneness of all things, but the relationship within that, right? With the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And how that would be reflected in that, given light from them, in fact, uh, from God, in order to know these things. And that would be where you would fuse together the article on Bonaventure with the article here having to do with Trinitarian ontology. Let's see. Let's see. In the broad sense, uh, it is, quote, each interpretation of the reality which explicit or implicit, starts from the place into which Christ led us. In the narrow sense, it is an interpretation which takes into account the strictly ontological meaning. In both senses, Trinitarian. Trinitarian through and through, right? Let me see. I want to make sure that I get the right one because there's, there's a fantastic part here and I'm just kind of scrambling around. In fact, let me take out these glasses. <laughs> I'm probably having a harder time because I'm using these glasses in order to figure this out. I'm like, I'm like oh my gosh. It's really dark in here. <laughs> really, really dark. Let's see. Maspero defines Trinitarian ontology not only as an ontology of the Trinity, but also as an ontology from the Trinity. That is, consideration of the being of the created world in the light which flows from the Trinitarian revelation. Thus, the basis for Trinitarian ontology is the theological teaching on the Holy Trinity. Now we're back into patristics. For real. This is what we're saying. Like, it's, it's, we are not alone here. We are not alone here. Entire institutes. Let's see. Uh, Milbank, of course, talked about this. He also agrees with this about the ontological categories. Trinitarian revision of ontological categories consists in, quote, a heightened place for event, motion, relation, and personhood with respect to the inherent priority um, of substance. talks about it must, that it goes beyond the boundaries of just simply formal logic, right? Yeah. It's fantastic, by the way. It's fantastic. Let's see, the author, yeah, because they mention, they mention here something that if they accepted this, right, creation is the image of the Trinity, 
uh, because both go beyond the borders of formal logic. He says, though, that um, the author famous argument, while Bradley concludes relations are just appearance, while in reality there is only an indivis- indivisible absolute, Milbank in turn enthusiastically approves of that, even, even the contradictions, but here it is. Uh, Trinitarian ontology was to be a view uh, of the world in light of the Holy Trinity. However, it turns out that the light is, a par- uh, paradoxically, apophatic, right? What is more, uh, we can doubt whether uh, this is really apophatic because negative theology questions merely the law of the excluded middle and double negation, while Milbank calls for the rejection of the very law of contradiction. The acceptance of real logical contradictions in dogmatics does not only go against centuries-long tradition, but also leads to destructive consequences both in philosophy and in theology. If it were the case, how could we maintain the fundamental thesis of Balthazar that, quote, formal creaturely logic is grounded in the Trinity and molded by it? So just like, the, just like formal logic, we're talking it claims that I make on individual things. I'm sorry, I'm sorry that it was a little bit scattered. I wasn't planning on talking about it. And as you can see, I got underlines all over the place. I apologize, okay? Um, I should have prepared a little better, but I saw it at the last minute. I figured out I'm gonna go ahead and say something. Why not? Um, but I want, I, want, I want you to just notice something, okay? So uh, whether it is our... Uh, having a knowledge of God, right? Implicit knowledge, right? Not not explicit knowledge of God. Not into the divine essence of God, right? But in the way that Bonaventure talks about. In, in work after work after work. In the way that Anselm talks about. In the way that Augustine talks about. That is what I'm talking about on this show. That's what I'm talking about. And as I said, the article that you should read on that, on that particular piece is the one about the, um, oh, good. Let me, let me make sure that I got the right one because it's fantastic. In fact, I got a whole bunch of these. I'll do, I'll do videos on each one of these uh, things that, let's see. I think it's this one here. Bonaventure's Critique of Thomas Aquinas. Go read that. Do yourself a favor and read this. I put it, I, in fact, you could just go to the Wolfpack chat. I have a whole long list of things in there that talk, that, that uh, quotes, just copied and pasted. I think it's four, it, you can put a lot of text. It's not, it's not as small as, as uh, Twitter. And I don't know how long if Facebook even, I don't know what Facebooks would be, right? What the maximum would be for that. But you can put a lot of letters and stuff, a lot of, a lot of characters on that. And I think all together, there was four parts to that, four of them. And in fact, I'll just go ahead and just say it right now. We'll talk about it for a second right now. Okay, because I already, I already took these out. So I'll just go right here. I'm gonna go over to the, um, the Wolfpack chat, okay? Or no, go to Paleocrat Diaries, sorry about that. So go into Paleocrat Diaries, scrolling up here in Paleocrat Diaries. Well, let's see, there we go. So go into part one. Okay, part one, talking about, um, oh, okay, I, I, had, I had even the Trinity one pulled up. <laughs> come on, are you serious right now? Oh, come on. Yeah, so I, so I had that too, I had, I had quotes, I could have just used that. See, look, I make it hard on myself. I'm reading this, I'm like, I already put it up there yesterday. I thought it was only, I thought I only did that for the, the, um, the links to do with uh, Bonaventure. Okay, I'm going to look up Bonaventure right now. And then, let's see, Bonaventure. Part one, part two, part one. That's where. Come on. So... The ones about Bonaventure here, you know, that's so weird. I'm trying to click on it, and it's not letting me click on it. What the heck? Oh, there we go. Okay. On man's knowledge of God. Okay, because I get flack on this all the time. On man's knowledge of God. This is by Bonaventure versus Aquinas, Brendan Case. This is part of the primer on Paleo Presa. And let me, let me, get, this, let me get this thing off the, off the screen. That way I'm not draining my computer here. Okay. So, first of all, he goes and he goes against ontologism. Because that's a, that's a complaint we're going to hear, right? We're going to hear the, the idea. They're going to say, oh, you know, holy cow, 
you know, you're, you're guilty of the exact same thing. And so Bonaventure goes through and breaks it down in a way that talks about beginning this discussion by exploring the implications of naming God who is, seeing in it the infinite fullness of perfection, which is presupposed to the knowledge of any and every finite reality. Holy cow! A doctor of the church is saying the same thing I am. Is he condemned as, as an ontologist? Are you going to go there with that for realsies? I'm only saying what he's saying. So what is he saying? The intellect, he argues, first knows being, which is identical with God. Bonaventure offers a rich and coherent account of human knowing, grounded in two plausible premises. The first is that the most fundamental object of our knowledge is always being. And so far, Bonaventure and Aquinas, they agree with each other on that. At first, and indeed second glance, the teaching of Itinerarium 3.3, or especially 5.3, can be accused. People will go, wait a second, holy cow. Is that, in fact, ontologism? Dun, dun, dun. No, of course not. <laughs> of course not. Because he rejects it. Notice, however, that first of all, the condemnation does not distinguish between what we might call implicit and explicit understanding. He expressly denies that God is the mind's first explicit object, while affirming, while affirming that we are always in some sense already acquainted with God in all our acts of knowing, just as some acquaintance with light is presupposed to, even if not explicitly thematized in every act of vision. Here's his quote, Remarkable is the blindness of the intellect, which does not consider that which it knows first, and without which it can know nothing. <laughs> Have you heard that before? Have you heard that before? Kind of weird, guys. Kind of weird. Wow. It's okay. Let's keep going. But as the eye, intent on various differences of colors, does not see the light by which it sees other things, or if it sees, does not notice it, so too the eye of our mind, intent on particular and universal beings, nonetheless, does not notice being itself beyond every genus, although it occurs first to the mind. His point is that we cannot help but be acquainted with the reality of God, who is the unreflected to be from which every particular borrows its being. Yeah. Yeah. Mega dope, by the way. Keeps going. Yeah, it, by the way, um, the idea... If it, has, if it has to do with explicit understanding, Bonaventure, in fact, criticizes uh, in the disputed questions on the knowledge of Christ, point four. That's what we're going to talk about here. We find a more expansive treatment of the mind's pre-theoretical acquaintance with the Lord. Sounds almost like a conceptual framework. <laughs> a pre-theoretical acquaintance with the Lord. Okay. Okay, yeah. Quote, whether whatever is known by us with certainty is known in the eternal principles, right? Question mark. It's, and by the way, that the, it, um, the eternal principles, uh, that's one of his favorite, uh, favorite uh, phrases to use, right? It's expression for the divine ideas, the exemplars subsisting in the divine intellect in and through which God knows and creates. Yeah. Bonaventure distinguishes amongst three possible ways of affirming this. First, that we only know the divine ideas. Second, that the divine ideas are the ultimate cause, but not the object of our knowledge. This is one of those things that in fear I've almost tiptoed. And there's a reason why Bonaventure said, no, nah, no, it's too cold. That's too, that's too weak. And third, that we know the divine ideas confusedly and indistinctly in and through our knowledge of particular beings. Strikingly, the same threefold schema appears both in Aquinas' discussion of the abstracting intellect in the commentary on the sentences and in the somewhat later exposition of uh, Boethius on the Trinity. The first position was, so to speak, too hot, right? Because it would assimilate all knowledge to the beatific vision. You would directly see the word. So hey, you, can't, you can't do that, right? In him, you would see all creatures actual and possible, right? No way. He insists that any account of human knowledge must keep our acquaintance with creatures at the center. In other words, your limitedness, that creator-creature distinction that we constantly are pounding away at over and over and over again. Otherwise, 
It would not explain our knowing so much as in fact explaining it away. The second approach, right? That it's just a conceptual framework. It doesn't really put together anything. It just makes it possible, right? It's just like, it's just a, a supplement. We need to figure it out to recognize, oh, okay, that's what that is. No, Bonaventure considers is much too cold in Aristotelian naturalism, according to which, quote, the eternal reason necessarily contributes to certain knowledge by way of its influence, so that the knower in knowing does not attain to the eternal reason, but only to its influence. He's critical of that, by the way. Yeah. Bonaventure has two main objections to this view. First, it fails as an interpretation of Augustine, who was insistent that, quote, that the mind in certain cognition has to be regulated. There we are back to the, the conceptual framework I talk about, regulated by immutable and eternal rules, not as through the habit of his mind, but as through those things which are above him in the eternal truth. That's where it's different. For instance, Augustine writes on the Trinity, we behold then by the sight of the mind and that eternal truth from which all things temporal are made, the form according to which we are and according to which we do anything, anything by true and right reason, either in ourselves or in things corporeal. And second, secondly, okay, if God's role in human knowing occurs only at the level of our dispositions to formulate reason's first principles, then, quote, God can no more be called the giver of wisdom than the fertilizer of the earth, nor should knowledge be said to come from him more so than wealth. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they go further. I, we could go on forever. I could read the whole article for that matter. I could read the entire thing. Talking about the Illuminationism, right? His middle way between the nothing but God Illuminationism and Aristotelian empiricism. Bonaventure takes it that we can only know necessary truths in particular if, along with creatures themselves, we also conduit the eternal archetypes which they express. Quote, things exist in their own genus and also in the mind in the, internal in the eternal principle, but their being is not entirely immutable in the first and the second modes, but only in the third, namely as they exist in the eternal word. And so it remains that nothing can make things to be perfectly intelligible unless Christ is present. <laughs> Come on now. Come on now. Yes. But to be clear, Bonaventure does not maintain that God is known first with any clarity or distinctness. Here below, we see only through a glass darkly. Nevertheless, nonetheless, Bonaventure stands firmly within the long Platonist tradition in insisting that timeless truths must refer to a timeless order, which undergirds and so renders intelligible our experience of time's ceaseless flux. Yeah. And he goes and he defends, of course, uh, the second ontological argument, right? Which is something can be thought, something can be thought to be which cannot be thought not to be which is greater than what can be thought not to be. So, if that than which a greater cannot be thought can be thought not to be, that very thing than which a greater cannot be thought is not that than which a greater cannot be thought, which is not fitting. So then, there truly is something than which a greater cannot be thought, which is such that it cannot be thought not to be. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, and somebody asks, he asks himself, how can you say that God's non-existence cannot be thought? Who else do you hear say that? God's non-existence cannot be thought. That it's an indubitable truth. And if you say those assertions are false, then you're not saying anything more than can be said of all necessary truths. Many of which are plainly uh, dubitable. So what's Bonaventure's presuppositional argument? This is the end of it. It's, it's five. The Agabon Selman. What, what did I call it? Agabon Selman, uh, Selmian? Agabon Selmian? Precept? <laughs> Augustine Bonaventure and so. Agabon Selmian. It is not that we cannot form the thought. God does not exist. Okay? 
So in other words, yes, you can form the thought. You can espouse it, in fact. Here's the quote. His existence is so evident in itself and certain for the knower that if he would rightly consider it, there is no way for its truth to be removed. For it is a truth most evident and most present which is absent from no place, no time, no thought, which is not the case with any other created truths. No place, no time, no thought, ever absent. Indubitable, son. Unavoidable, inescapable. Invincible, by the way. The reason that God cannot coherently be thought not to exist by the way, I want to give a big shout out <laughs> to the author of this, Brennan Case, one of the best presuppositional arguments I've heard in a long time. I need to talk to this guy. <laughs> the reason that God cannot coherently be thought not to exist is that if he exists at all, he exists in such a way that his existence is totally unconditioned by anything else, but rather conditions everything else. It is the uninflicted to be at the heart of every statement with existential import and so accompanies every thought, even the thought there is no God. And listen to this. And tell me where you've heard this before. Tell me where you've heard this before. Only the fool can form this thought. Because only a fool would contradict himself in his very act of speaking. His very act of speaking. Why do I bring that up? Not only because it's mega dope. <laughs> and you got to just go read it. I read a bunch of it for you. I read a bunch of it for you right now. Okay. Let's see. So, uh, black and charity, angelic doctors, maybe judges. So, okay. I, I, have an, I have an editor that constantly is posting conversations in the poll, in the chat. Stop doing that. <laughs> Veronica, stop doing that. I was like, did I write that? No, I did not write that. <sighs> yeah, you got you to gotta put at least your name on there. Yeah, otherwise I'm going to be confused. The reason I bring it up is how many times have I talked about Wittgenstein's ladder? How many times? We'd have to pass over the rest in silence. We'd have to pass over the rest. You got to keep your mouth shut. In fact, even the mouth of the mind. You'd have to keep it shut, right? Because you would, you would have noticed at the end of the argument, once you've reached the end, what's supposed to be a coda, all of a sudden you realize that the system has collapsed on itself. And why? Because it's an espoused worldview that rejects the most fundamental thing that they cannot escape at any time or place. And that's God. That's God. So over and over and over and over and over and over again, we see this play out. Yeah. We see it play out. No, logical truths would be, logical truths would be rooted in him. It would not be, yeah, he would not be some kind of logical truth. Yeah. It would be contingent upon him. He's not contingent upon anything else. Right. Yeah, I don't know where that's coming from, Danny. I don't know how much how much Trinitarian theology are you, you are you a Catholic? What are you? Have you studied much Trinitarian theology? I don't know what the, I don't know why you would walk away with that being the case. And especially especially with Bonaventure's many, many, many works on that. Yeah, well, a lot of people do, Danny. Are you are you a believer, Danny, or are you an unbeliever? What are you? How much? Oh, you're an atheist. Oh, yeah. I don't know how an atheist. Uh, I don't know how an atheist with an atheist worldview could come up with almost anything at all. I used to be an atheist for seven years, and I and I wasn't just a guy, Rando Joe, right? I was on the state board for Center for Inquiry, Michigan, right? And so spoke with Secular Student Alliance. I had a, a featured profile over there. So I'm not. I, it's not that I'm unfamiliar with atheism. I just think that its worldviews, plural, are poo-poo trash. And we're going to talk about that a little bit right now. We're going to talk a little bit about that right now. And yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on what your view of God is, but your view of God is, is automatically warped. I mean, there's no doubt about it. it. I think it'd be really tough for you if you were to be frank and honest about it. I think it would probably be tough for you 
to describe the Catholic view of the Trinity. I think that'd be a tough thing. Maybe I'm wrong. I could be wrong. I don't want to be presumptuous about it. Okay. So, and in fact, I'm quite glad you're here. Yeah, of course. You think you think it's poo poo trash. The only difference is you can't account from your worldview. You can't even account how you can provide for the universals or one and many. You're trapped in that. You're trapped in this great, this great, this great mystery, right? It's a mystery cult for you guys. It's a, it's a mystery cult of absurdism, to be quite frank. How you would distinguish between particulars and generalities, or how you could, how you could without, without committing, uh, w- without committing the fallacy of composition, how you would be able to extrapolate from particulars universals, whether that's logic or anything like that, or how you would even have abstractions, right? Immaterial things, even like numbers and such from a materialistic worldview. It's kind of a little bit bizarre. Kind of a little bit bizarre. But okay, so the nihilism of destruction. Yeah. Yeah. I'll let everybody else in the comment section handle it. I'm glad you're watching, by the way. So the nihilism of destruction, right? The realist... Bazarov said there's not a single institution of our society that should not be destroyed. Who wishes to be creative, said Nietzsche, must first destroy and smash accepted values. End quote. The manifesto of the futurists, who are perhaps as near to pure nihilism as to vitalism, glorified war and, quote, the, destruct, the destroying arm of the Antichrist. Nietzsche proclaimed the basic principle of all nihilism and the special apology of the nihilism of destruction in the phrase, there is no truth. All is permitted. It kind of cracks me up, by the way. And you'll have people who go, no, I believe, I believe in truth. You know, I, I, I definitely believe in, in right and wrong. And they'll be able to point out particular things and say, you know, something like flourishing. But they're constantly, if you push them back further and further and further, they're using some, they're using some kind of an ethical grid in order to determine whether certain things are rightly categorized as flourishing and whether or not there would be any obligation that is, that is incumbent on anyone other than themselves. They can't just look and say, that's flourishing, therefore everybody must do that. Based on what? That's pure power. That's all it is. It's pure power. They can try to make the case all they want, say, I got a mega dope argument. I got a mega dope argument. You should check it out. It's real good. Yeah, it's like asking them, hey guys, why don't you come up with the Ten Commandments of some kind? Who's going to accept that? It'd be attributed to some cat in what, New Jersey or something? <laughs> some guy in a, in, in a philosophy department somewhere? I, I came up with the, the Ten Commandments of Secular Humanism. <laughs> okay, whoop do you do good for you? Start your own little cult, weirdo. Start your own little cult. Because at the end of the day, by what? why should that be obligatory at all? Where would you even get a normative ethic? Is your, is your normative ethic purely conventional? Is your idea of universals and logic purely conventional? Max Stirner declared war upon every standard and every principle, proclaiming his ego against the world and laughing triumphantly over the tomb of humanity. Let's see here. Destruction is an indispensable item in the program of nihilism. And further that it is the most unequivocal expression of the worship of nothingness, that it is the, that lies at the center of the nihilist theology. The nihilism of destruction is not an exaggeration. It's rather a fulfillment of the deepest aim of all nihilism. In it, nihilism is assumed its most terrible, but its truest form. In it, the face of nothingness discards its mask and stands revealed in all of its nakedness. Now, he mentions this thing, the theology of nihilism. What is that exactly? What is that exactly? The theology and the spirit of nihilism. We're going to find out. Rebellion, the war against God. Okay, because if you're looking at it, we've already talked about the the dialectic thus far. You've got liberalism, realism, vitalism, nihilism of destruction. That's the, the, the four phases that Eugene, Father Sarah from Rose, talks about in that portion on the dialectic of nihilism in the book. He talks, of course, rather, it's not some cookie-cutter thing that, well, it's not like uh, um, 
dispensational hermeneutic that goes, oh yeah, at this time of history, from this date to this date, it was bracketed and this was the exact moral law. And then over here, it was just that. And, and it kind of changes from this and that. And everybody in that uh, portion of time was beholden to those particular things, which, which it was a huge discontinuity and later replaced by these moral norms and standards and expectations. It's not that when it comes to these phases. He even says that you may have each individual or each uh, group of people, each people group would be a mix of these things. But you can see the psychological phases as it goes along. I think that we're there now, by the way. I believe that we, I, I believe that we are already right now into the battle that goes on between uh, traditional theism, okay, and particularly Trinitarian theism and nihilism, the theology and the spirit, in fact, of nihilism. It's time then to attack the nihilist doctrine at its root, not to go after piecemeal bit by bit by bit, not bit by bit by bit, okay? So rather than going, well, let's, let's, uh, let's attack this one program at a time. And there is a role for that. I mean, laws are laws. So, I mean, you're going to go after one particular law here or one particular economic policy over here. But in a, in, in a civilizational crisis to recognize the, the clash of systems, you're not just talking about one particular claim. You're talking about the way that these things work together and even the way that certain things may emerge from that interplay within the, the specifics of that system, the particulars of that system. So we have to go after the roots, the spiritual roots, its ultimate program and its role in the, in the Christian theology of history. In this task, we are greatly aided by the systematic nihilists like Nietzsche, who express unequivocally the other, uh, what others only suggest or attempt to disguise. And by acute observers of the nihilist mentality like Dostoevsky, whose insights strike to the very heart of nihilism and strip aside its masks. In no one has the nihilist revelation been more clearly expressed than in Nietzsche. We've already seen this revelation in its philosophical form in the phrase, there is no truth. Its alternative, more explicitly theological expression in Nietzsche is the contrast, is the constant theme significantly of the inspired prophet Zarathustra. And in its earliest occurrence in Nietzsche's writings, it is the ecstatic utterance of the madman, God is dead. The words express a certain truth, not to be sure a truth of the nature of, a, of things, but a truth concerning the state of modern man. And there's a lot of misunderstanding as to what that means, right? It's not even, and this is why I think, I think the atheists a lot of times get themselves wrapped up in a self-congratulatory service, right? Patting each other on the back. Like, because there's a lot of people who are no longer going to church, then that's indicative of people embracing that or, or wanting to baptize the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, as, as somehow belonging to them. They do, in a way, the spirit of what they bring, but these are different modes of thought. These are different things. And so the idea of God's not dead for most people, for most atheist people, they say, well, yeah, you, you, don't, you don't kill God by not thinking about him. You don't, God wouldn't die that way if God existed. An atheist would say, no, God doesn't, God doesn't exist. Some of them leaning more on the agnostic side of things. I think it's a dying breed. But some of those that fall more along the agnostic side would say, well, we can't prove one way or another. Mo even most of those would say, well, he probably does not. Of course, they don't, they don't account for how could we do things like statistical probability in a world where you don't have a trinity, where you don't have the one and the many, the equal ultimacy of these things. They, they, don't, even, they don't even attempt to do it. They just say, but I do statistics. <laughs> but I do right and wrong. What do you, again, good for you. It doesn't justify anything. You're just begging the question with every single time you engage in a particular thing. But they might say, well, God doesn't exist, but the vast majority of people, the average just Johnny Q, Sally Sue in the West, and in fact, as a, the mission creep of nihilism all around the world, is that more and more and more you have people, they're just simply uninterested. It seems irrelevant. You can believe it, but you don't have to. In fact, it might just be really hard to. Maybe they would even envy. I, I wish I could believe that. 
and that there's no consequence for not believing it. It's one of many different truths that's equally available to them. It's the triumph of coexist. Those stupid flags, by the way. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about, those stupid flags. God is dead in the hearts of modern man. This is what the death of God means. Man has lost his faith in God and in the divine truth that once sustained him. The apostasy of, to worldliness that has characterized the modern age since its beginning becomes, in Nietzsche, conscious of itself and finds words to express itself. Deeper than the subjective fact the nihilist revelation expresses lie a will and a plan that go far beyond any mere acceptance of fact. Okay, And with this, this is the counter-revolution directed against Christian revelation. An entirely new spiritual universe opens up in which God exists no longer, in which, more significantly, men do not wish for God to exist. They're uninterested in that. They don't like hearing that. They're terribly uncomfortable by it. They don't like being reminded of their obligations. They'll diminish it. It's easy to put it into comedy. It lets them laugh in their sin and squalor all the while talking about flourishing. Flourishing in a world where you have HPV spreading like mad. You have, you have casual sex spreading like mad. You have people aborting themselves out of existence, contracepting themselves out of existence, lgbtqia themselves out of existence. And all the while thinking, in fact, that that's a really brilliant thing, not even understanding for a nanosecond the implications that this has just on the demographic. <laughs> These people talk about numbers all the time. And you're like, dude, just the demographics shift in that. Holy cow. Do you guys not understand why superstructures need to have in-group, out-group, transgenerational commitments? Things to do with marriage? Ceremonies surrounding being born as a child? Like baptism, for example? Growing old? Right? Or at least maturing, coming of age, like your like your confirmation ceremony, for example. Or your idea that you're now married and becoming your own individual in order to cleave unto a husband and a wife so that you can procreate. That's called marriage, for example. Or having babies, and now you're back to baptism, bringing somebody into the covenantal body, the superorganism. Because even just from a purely scientific standpoint and a sociological standpoint, the superorganism wins. Read some hype. Read some E.O. Wilson. Read some David Sloan Wilson. <laughs> They're not, I can advise them all day long. They're not going to do it. They can read that stuff and, and it doesn't matter. This is how you know. This is how you know that the truth simply doesn't matter. I wish there was a better example. But Bill Nye, the science guy in that stupid rap, the stupid, why don't you just try it out? You might have fun to get you some. Boy with boy, girl with girl, don't matter no more. The binary's fake. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's garbage trash. It is the, it's the, I said it before. It's the worst rap that's ever been made. It's not even a rap. I don't even know what to categorize that. It's just like diarrhea coming out. <laughs> diarrhea of the mouth. It's terrible. And you can tell them all day long. Say, look, dude, these guys, they don't even understand. You go back and you say, hey, bro, you do realize that your old videos had that stuff on there. Oh, crap. Uh, yeah, they did. Uh, uh, I think we got to remove that. Are you going to put anything with it like a disclaimer? Uh, no, we never did that. <laughs> you didn't. Wow. It's neat how you all of a sudden see the world through this super satanic lens. Some ugly chicks rapping about, about chicks doing chicks and such. Again, they're going to contracept themselves out of existence. They are going to abort themselves out of existence. It will get so bad that they will continue. We've seen the first fruits of it already where they say, oh, there's so much white privilege in the world. And atheists will say this because atheism is a white person cult. It's a white person cult. I look at, look at images from Reason Rally and tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> tell me I'm wrong. Look at all the major atheist organizations on the planet. You are going to find the overwhelming majority of them are weird, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic, and super dupe, yeah, super dupe white. Super dupe white. 
And they're going to say, look, you know, white privilege, it's so bad right now. What we got to do, we got to make sure we're not having any more kids. We got to make sure it's like, it's totally terrorism to have a bunch of white kids walking around. It's better if I just like live and then just die. Nobody really know anyway. And I'll just go back to being the stardust from whence I came. Isn't that cool? Or global warming is so bad. Overpopulation is so wicked bad. We, we ought to not have any more kids anymore. Or I want to I have a great job and I want to make a big career for myself. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm not going to have any kids. Bunch of sex in the city ladies being old with no kids but some cats. Watching as all their friends who, by the way, were religious and getting married. And didn't want that life that <laughs> the creator had with that particular show. Enjoying their lives with their kids and their grandkids. Passing along those genes. Just statistical probability that unless you come up with some special thing by using power, power, whether political, lawfare, doesn't matter, Hollywood, doesn't matter, you're stuck with it. Because you don't, con- ultimately, you're a deconverting machine. That's all you are. Deconversion. So it's insane. And they're going to they're going to end up withering and withering and withering. They don't they've never even studied the basic structure of of small groups, the the history of small groups and how small groups work. And how you have to have a balance of the one and the many. And of course they can't. So they're either going to be they're going to be a strange mix of anybody can be anything they want. Diversity, yay! The diversophilia and at the same time, the kind of collectivism that you have with SJWism. And it's going to be this constant tension, this constant cognitive dissonance floating around in their skull. And so they don't know how to do it. They wouldn't, they don't have, there's no way they can do a Maypole. The best they've got is a Festivus. It's the best they got. Civilization is, believe it or not, as dumb as civilization can be, smarter than that in the long run. Because in the end, unless you guys procreate, you will come and you will go. You're like, you're like those old churches with, you know, a bunch of people in their 90s. And I bless their hearts and stuff. I mean, I'm glad they went to church. But if they didn't create children, or if they don't, if they don't have any way to rejuvenate that, those churches will close their doors and weeds will grow around them. And then some other place will end up purchasing it. But the memory of that will go. So scramble and do your best. Try your best because your side is dying. It's inevitable. Because you are fools. The death of God has not simply happened to him as a kind of cosmic catastrophe. Rather, he has actively willed it. Not directly to be sure but equally effective, right? By preferring something else to the true God. Nor is the nihilist, let us note, really atheistic. And this is where we get back to the nuns. This is where we get back to that. It may be doubted indeed if there exists such a thing as atheism. For no one denies the true God except to devote himself to the service of a false one. The atheism that is possible to the philosopher is not possible to the whole man. Is, is it Proudon? Proudon? Saw this clearly enough. Declared himself not an atheist, but an anti-theist. Quote, the revolution is not atheistic in the strict sense of the word. It does not deny the absolute. It eliminates it. The first duty of man on becoming intelligent and free is to continually hunt the idea of God out of his mind and conscience. For God, if he exists, is essentially hostile to our nature. Humanity must be made to see that, quote, God, if there is a God, if there is a God, is its enemy. Others talk about rebellion being the rank of first principle. Others were not content to refute the existence of God. Quote, if God really existed, it'd be necessary to abolish him. I think that we made that turn a while ago. 
I do. I don't, and I, and I don't think it's as old as people think. You I mean you have you have your precursors, right? But you get to this place where there's a general sense. It's like, look, we don't believe there's a God, but yet we're surrounded by a society where the ideas that that developed over thousands of years that were associated in all different places all around the world to various different shades and degrees were affected by theism. It's got to be rooted out. It's got to be rooted out, but it's all over the place. It's all over. And so more and more and more people are discontent to just consider themselves atheists. And most atheists function as anti-theists. Kind of like uh, 99.9999% of agnostics function like atheists, having no reference to the divine. Revolutionary nihilism stands irrevocably and explicitly against God. But philosophical and existential nihilism is equally anti-theistic in its assumption that modern life must henceforth continue without God. And and this is a valuable point. And yeah, somebody says, what's what's wrong with this guy? (laughs) What's wrong with this guy? I took a knee for Christ the King. It's something you should do. It's something you should do. Well, I don't know. Are you talking about are you talking about me, buddy? One zero zero one zero one one zero one one zero one zero. Is that you? Are you talking to me? What is this? Are you talking to unbelievers? What are you what are you talking about? And by the way, if you wanna if you wanna address me specifically, anybody in the chat, if you want to address me specifically, just put it at Paleocrat. It's easy enough to do. The army of the enemies of God is recruited as much from the many who passively accept their position in the rear guard as from the few active enthusiasts who occupy the front ranks. More important to observe, however, is the fact that the ranks of anti-theism are swelled not only by active and passive atheists, but by many who think themselves religious and worship some god. All right, dude, we're we're good then. One zero zero one zero one one zero one one zero one zero. What is that, bro? Come on, man, hook me up. Yeah, who wants to chase God out of it, dude? I'm with you 100, percent homie. Yeah, the person who wants to chase God out of everything, the person, the person who gets his teeth on a grind, and think, just ask yourself, just ask yourself of the atheist people that you know who talk about it, not the passive ones, the active ones. Do they seem to have an obsession, right? Like a anti-God complex? Do they seem to have a preoccupation with death? Like, you know, on the whole, on the where the ninja thing, you know, <laughs> make all the kids in the bubble thing. You remember that? Okay. A couple of years ago. And so, and it still it still kind of floats around every once in a while, right? You see, you see some people that are like, "You're supposed to still be doing this." You're like, "What's your problem, weirdo? What's your problem?" Right? But have you seen how angry they are? They say that they're not. Do you see how, see how easily manipulated so many of them are by corporate schemes and interests, for example, by t- really trendy stuff. Do you see how many of them, it's not just simply that they're quiet people who say, I don't believe. It's people who go, no, I have an obligation to take down you and your God. You notice that? I know I can't be the only one. Tell me you guys notice. And yeah, swoosh, be fruitful and multiply. We must, in fact, evangelize. Yeah, we've got, we have to evangelize. Oh, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheers here to America. Hold on. I'm going to cheers to America. And the triumph of Christ the King, by the way, we're part of this. Are you pumped? Are you ready to give it all you've got because it's a fight? Are you ready? Are you psyched? Are you committed? 100% pedal to the metal? I hope so. God bless you, America. God bless America. 
but the people who claim to be religious. So it's not, it, it, it's more than just anti-theism, right? The abyss, the annihilation, right? It's, it's, like, a, it's like a snowball. It picks up steam. And it's going to pick up more and more. More and more people will end up with a crazy kind of malaise. And as they do, detaching more and more from institutionalized religion, more and more and more from Christ the King, more and more from divine revelation, more and more from the superorganism, right? The superorganism of organized religion that provides uh, uh, ideas regarding right and wrong, what's true, what's false, purpose in the world, where we came from, where we're going, the balance of the one and the many, the harmony and the equilibrium of these things, safeguards built on traditions, purity cultures. Yeah. But whether it's explicitly atheist or agnostic, or takes the form of the worship of some new God, nihilism has for its foundation the declaration of war on the true God. Totally, 100%, no doubt about it. Formal atheism is the philosophy of a fool. Right? If we can paraphrase this, the psalmist here. Formal atheism is the philosophy of the fool. But antitheism is a profounder malady. The literature of antitheism, to be sure, is full of inconsistencies and contradictions, as is formerly atheist literature. But where the latter errs through childishness, the former owes its distortions to a deep-seated passion that recognizing these realities wills to destroy them. Petty arguments, right? Easy, easily explained and refuted. No longer a danger to a secure faith, but the profound and determined attack, right, of the antitheist is of a different matter. For it's born not of bloodless sophistry, but of great fervor. It's animated by a faith as strong in its own way and as spiritual in its roots as the Christian faith in attempts to destroy and supplant. We need to recognize that. We need to recognize that the, the people coming after the Christian order, the people coming after Christian civilization, right? All the people, the, the, the savages in the gates at this point, there's, and it's a wide range. It's not equally distributed. But at the same time, the driving force of that is a wicked bad malady. It's wicked bad. It's animated by a kind of faith and nothingness, in fact. And it's strong. It's drunk. It's wicked. It's wicked a whack. <laughs> it's a wicked a whack for, uh, faith in nothingness. It's spiritual in its roots. And in fact, what kind of spirit? It's satanic. The success of nihilism in our time has been dependent upon and may be measured by the spread of this spirit. Its arguments seem persuasive, not to the degree that they're true, but to the degree that this spirit has prepared men to accept it. It's talking about uh, the psychology of the apostate. I think that if people want to understand the psychology of the apostate, one of the books on that Right outside, like especially for the nihilists, but I think that, you know, if uh, I think I think it's one of these things where the devil was whispering in the ear of Frederick Nietzsche when he wrote the Antichrist, right? When he wrote Antichrist, uh, and talking about it's basically the the anatomy of apostasy. It's a remarkable text, in fact. Some people say that uh, the archa what is that the Archangel Michael whispering into the ear of C.S. Lewis for screw tape letters. I think the, the opposite could be said of who is whispering into the ear of Nietzsche when he wrote Antichrist. And if we, underst if we understand, if we understand um, um, how, how apostasy works, not just as an individual, but as a group, and to recognize the groupish dynamics of this, to recognize, and we, we, get, we get trapped in this a little bit because of the highly individualistic uh, culture that we have. The way that so many have come to embrace the world is this individualism, my, my truth, right? What I think is right, what I think is wrong. You can't force that belief on me, that kind of thing. The individualism that drives that, which if it was balanced would be excellent, perfectly, <laughs> a perfectly good thing, but taken to an extreme. Sometimes we fail to recognize the influence of the superorganism. And the impact that has on the free rider dilemma and how people who claim to be independent 
aren't nearly as independent as they think. And most people who claim to be independent see it all the time, but they don't recognize it. And that it's in fact a parody even on them when they watch something like South Park and they see the goth kids all looking the same and acting the same and listening to the same music. And a lot of people say, well, I'm watching South Park. And look, I've enjoyed a lot of episodes of that. And I think it's hilarious, right? Many, right? But I'm a fan. But at the same time to recognize, even, even in voting patterns, right? Viewing patterns, voting patterns, a lot of people would say, oh, I'm an independent, man. I'm independently thinking. I'm an independent-minded person. Their voting, their voting record is almost, almost entirely partisan and predictably partisan. And so we forget the power and the draw of the superorganism in eradicating the free riders. The societal pressure on free riders to conform. E even if it's in such a way that the free rider can continue to believe that even in their conforming, right? Periodically conforming to various degrees, that when they do that, that they're still being really independent. What then is the nature of the nihilist faith? Full of doubt. Suspicion, disgust, envy, jealousy, pride, impatience, rebelliousness, blasphemy, an attitude of dissatisfaction with the self, with the world, with society, with God. It knows but what thing? One thing. That it will not accept things as they are, but must devote its energies either to changing them or to fleeing from them. And at that point, I think we're talking about SJWism. <laughs> and we're talking about a lot of mainstream media. Right? I hate to be I hate to be so cookie cutter on that. But I think it's true. Of the activist branch, of the activist the, the, the activist wings on there that, that, that would like to see nothing more than the eradication of one after another after another after another traditional platforms, traditional laws, traditional values, traditional customs and courtesies. To see the total overhaul, the total transformation. Yeah. That's a nihilist faith, full of doubt, suspicion, disgust, envy, jealousy, pride, impatience, rebelliousness, blasphemy. Of course, you could say Comedy Central. <laughs> At this point, you could probably say Nickelodeon, <laughs> Disney, right? Not even joking. We should be prepared to understand the nature of the success of nihilism or the existence of systematic representatives of it, if we seek its source anywhere, we won't be prepared, but in the primal satanic will uh, uh, to negation and rebellion. We have to go back. We have to have some kind of a, of a way, archetypally, to say, look, this is how we understand it. This is the root. This is what, this is how we can see most clearly what we see sometimes, even if only in shadows, even if only in part that we know that we are back to that place again and again and again, back to the garden. And how often have we talked about that in the presuppositional presuppositionalism series? We talk about it with the Monaco men. We talk about it with the suspicionistas, the people constantly questioning the church and opening up the scrolls, right? Haven't been able to do this in a minute. Breaking out the monocle, looking to make sure that everything's just right. Yes, I figured it out. World, why don't you look and listen to me? I can assure you we're A-OK -okay today. It's another one of those whoop-dee-doo, good-for-you moments. And it goes back to the garden where you put God in the dock. in a rebellion against authority, right? The rejection of the Christian faith and the institutions then is the result not so much of the loss of faith in them and in their divine origin as of rebellion against the authority they represent and the obedience they command. Think about it. Richard says, I converted to Catholicism three years ago precisely for these civilizational issues. Dude, that was a big deal for me too. It's a big deal for me. In fact, coming back, I, I had fallen away, man, from the faith for seven years. I was an atheist for seven years. When I, when I came back to the faith, uh, a lot of it had to do with these civilizational issues. 
A lot of them had to do with the issue of the superstructures, the superorganisms, had to do with in-group, out-group behavior, had to do with the balance of the one and the many in social theory, cultural theory, whatever. It didn't matter. Whatever, whatever, whatever theory of the world, how we ought to live our lives, how we ought to think, how we ought to behave, how we ought to balance the future with the past, having our head in the present, one foot in the future, one foot in the past, the continuity of that, that recognizes the democracy of the dead with the democracy of those yet to come. And those would be the only kinds of democracy I'm down for, <laughs> right? Those who've died, the traditions, and those I'm passing those traditions on to. Those that we, are, that we are making in that transgenerational continuity of the covenant in space and time. Dominion. But they rebel. People, it's easy to say, well, it's because they don't have faith anymore. That's why they're against it. But that's, they're back to this idea that they can be just sincerely in the world where they're like, yeah, I'm not sure if God exists. I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> it's indubitable. It's indubitable. They cannot get around it. No time, no place. None at all. They're rebelling. They do not like that these institutions represent something. They're symbols, in fact. And they're more than that because there's life inside, for real. It's not just something pointing. It's something that's got life within. Supercharged, in fact. And they don't like the obedience that it requires of them, especially in this day and age of autonomy. This day and age where we think we're so darn smart Super dupe smart, able to make those decisions. Yeah, I, I, I don't agree with that. I've read a couple websites. <laughs> I've read a couple magazines. They don't like that they have to submit. They put God in the dock just like Eve. They, they, they put God in the dock and say, you know, I don't know if God really said that. And then they taste and they like, they enjoy. It brings death. It brings sadness and all sorts of thorns, all sorts of pains and sorrows. And yet they can't stop because they refuse to take a knee for Christ the King. They refuse to subject themselves to an authority higher than themselves. And that's why I say, I think deep down inside, one of the most tra traumatic things that, that, that mortals, right? The creatures experience in this world is the realization not only that they're going to die, but that they're dying means that they are not God. It's terribly bothersome. And so they just LARP at the meantime. This rebellion is less concerned to demolish the philosophical and theological foundations of the old order than to destroy, destroy the rival faith which gave it life. Yeah. Termite tactics. Termite tactics of dominion. I say, well, what would be easier? What would be easier? Right? Demolishing the philosophical and theological foundation of these or to destroy the rival faith which gave it life. Doctrines and institutions may be reinterpreted, emptied of their Christian content and filled with a new nihilist content. <laughs> but Christian faith, the soul of these doctrines and institutions and alone capable of discerning this reinterpretation and effectively opposing it must be completely destroyed before it can itself be reinterpreted. Yeah. Termite tactics are necessary. I think that's one of the reasons why people should familiarize themselves with the various tactics of the godless, the various tactics of those who would like nothing more than to topple the church. It's a practical necessity, in fact, if nihilism is to triumph. More, it is a psychological and even a spiritual necessity for nihilist rebellion dimly senses that the truth resides in Christian faith. And its jealousy and its uneasy conscience will not be appeased until the total abolition of faith has justified its position and proved its truth. On a minor scale, this is the psychology of the Christian apostate. Yeah, and there we are.
It's it, on a minor scale. It is the it is the psychology of the apostate. It's not. It, it's one thing to say I no longer believe. They desperately, desperately, desperately need you to agree with them. And if you don't agree with them, they'll plea with you. They'll make you feel guilty for not agreeing with them. And in the end, if you still don't submit, if you still don't take that knee, they are going to come against you. They're going to cancel you. They're going to they're going to deplatform you, deperson you. Yeah, turn my tactics of dominion. It seeks to tear down the foundations. Yes, that's what they're going to go after. And suicide's the end game, by the way. Florinian guy, suicide is the end game of consistent atheism on a societal scale, all the way down to the individual. Which, by the way, one of the reasons for the push so often of euthanasia, but more than that, just the idea, right? Abortion, ab aborting, uh, abortion, contraception, LGBTQIA, everything else. All the many, the myriad reasons. Like that guy, there was a dude, poor, poor dude on TikTok or something. Some guy. And he's sitting there and he's like, I'll tell you what. If the Supreme Court overturns Roe, I'm going to do it. I swear I'm going to do it. I'm going to get a vasectomy. <laughs> that's, suicide to his, that, that's suicide to the generations that will come from him. Poor dude. I hope that he I hope he was bluffing. It's not good to mutilate the gonads. It's true. Some apologists are fond of citing corruptions or abuses or injustices in the old order as justification for rebellion against it. But such things, the existence of which no one will deny, have been often the pretext, but never, in fact, the cause. Never the cause. It's one of those things that goes back to St. Francis de Sales, his introduction in the book, Catholic Controversy. He talks about scandal. Who bears the burden of scandal? At the end of the day, he refused to accept it. He said he would, he would reject a million different charges leveled against the general body of the church. And he tossed it all back on them. That they would have been better, in fact, to have taken a knee, to cry out for forgiveness on their own. Not only for themselves, but for those around them and true order. In the political and social order, nihilism manifests itself as a revolution that intends not a mere change of government or a more or less widespread reform of the existing order, but the establishment of an entirely new conception of the end and means of government. In the religious order, not a mere reform of the church and not even the foundation of a new church or religion but a complete refashioning of the idea of religion and of spiritual experience. This is true in art and literature, a whole new approach to the question of artistic creation and a new definition, in fact, of art. It's the very first principles of these disciplines that are under attack. It's what Ronald Knox saw. Ronald Knox saw this coming a mile away. It's one of the reasons why he said we need to reemphasize the way that apologetics is done. The five ways we need to only talk about one. That was his model. But what was the underlying motivation for that, for that idea, for that advisement, and for his prayer that there would one day be someone that he refers to as his author, or my author, or the author that he's talking about in the future who will come and will challenge the paradigm of Catholic apologetics. What was it that drove him to that place? It was the attack that he saw on Catholic presuppositions. He saw that they were under attack and he said, we need to go back and emphasize the arguments that all the others presuppose, that all the others are based upon, without which it makes no sense. We need to get back to the roots because the roots are under attack. We need to get to the foundations, the things that make them meaningful, the things that make it intelligible. He saw it a mile away and he was right. Before the modern age, the life of man was largely conditioned by the virtues of obedience, submission, and respect to God, to the church, to lawful earthly authorities. But now we have a new thing. 
We have a thing with nothingness. The worship of nothingness. In the sense in which modern nihilism understands it, it's a concept unique to the Christian tradition, in fact. The non-being of various Eastern traditions is an entirely different, uh, it's, an, it's an entirely different, a positive conception. The nearest they approach to the idea of, of nothingness is their obscure notion of primal chaos. God has spoken only obscurely and indirectly to other people. To his chosen people alone, he revealed the fullness of truth concerning the beginning and the end of things. To other people indeed, and to the unaided reason, one of the most difficult of Christian doctrines to understand is that of creation out of nothing. God's creation of the world out of himself, not out of some pre-existent matter or primal chaos, but out of nothing. In no other doctrine is the omnipotence of God so plainly stated. But what relation, it may be asked, was nihilism to such a doctrine? It has the relation of denial. What, says Nietzsche, in a statement whose last sentence we already cited in a different context, does nihilism mean that the highest values are losing their value? There's no goal. There's no answer to the question, why? Nihilism, in a word, owes its whole existence to the negation of Christian truth. It finds the world absurd, not as a result of dispassionate dispassionate research into the question, but through inability or unwillingness to believe its Christian meaning. Only men who once thought they knew the answer to the question why could be so disillusioned to discover that there was no answer after all. We're back to the idea that you can only smack God's face if God, in fact, sets you on his lap and makes you with arms <laughs> in the first place. We're back to that place where somebody's using logic. We're back to Wittgenstein's ladder. You're using something. You're using arguments. You're using induction. You're using the uniformity of nature. You're using logic. You're using right and wrong, good and evil, all these things in order to live and move and have your being. And what do you do? You ascend that ladder and you reach this great place and you realize that when you're there, it's all freaking absurd. It means nothing. At best, at best, but it meant something to me. In the moment, it meant something to me. Ah. You, you did not ask to be born. Your meaning here is entirely your own creation. Maybe there will be other people who will say, yeah, she was a decent chick. One day, it's all going to disappear. And you'll be nothing more than a sound that came and went, a ripple on a lake that vibrated for a nanosecond. For no reason at all. And then just stop. Again, for no reason at all. With no aim or no goal. You're just enjoying the stroll. I don't know why you're here. And people say, well, that's still meaning. And I say, yes, and you can still come up with meaning in the movie. They shoot horses, don't they? Now you still could. You have meaning going round and around and around and around you go. You have meaning all day long. Oh, man. Oh, I, I have really a lot of significant meaning. I've come up with a narrative from my life. I, I, I'm kind of cool and, and I've got a real purpose and I've got to give it my all. And you're like, for what? What's the point? And in the end, I don't want to live that way. And the absurdity of the end is to arrest the guy. And I, I don't want, want to give too much away, but just to say, blam! They shoot horses, don't they? <laughs> All the while, what arrest them for what? Because they didn't have meaning as they were going around in a circle all the time, not going anywhere, not even sure how they got there. Saying, don't ask why, don't ask why, just smile all the time. <laughs> They're looking, who? The, the flash mob with all the pitchforks threatening to cancel you <laughs> if you don't smile. Whacked out. whacked out yet if Christianity were merely one religion or philosophy among many its denial would not be a matter of such great import right 
You have one Catholic writer said there have always been some forms of religion in the world and wicked men who oppose them, but only in the bosom of the true religion can there be real impiety. Although uh, impious men have always existed, there never was before the 18th century in the heart of Christendom an insurrection against God. That's why we talked about secular age. That's why we talked about it. No other religion has affirmed so much and so strongly as Christianity because its voice, in fact, is the voice of God and its truth is absolute. No other religion has had so radical and uncompromising an enemy as nihilism. For no one can oppose Christianity without doing battle with God himself. To fight the very God who has created him out of nothingness requires, of course, a certain blindness, as well as the illusion of strength. But no nihilist is so blind that he fails to sense, however dimly, the ultimate consequences of his actions. He lives and moves and has his being in a world that God created. He's got a conscience. He's ensouled. He's got a purpose. Beautifully and wonderfully made. But refusing to take a knee instead, rather to give all of the thanks and gratitude that are deserving, or that the Lord, in fact, deserves, and that we owe him for his greatness and glory, instead to give it to a bazillion other things, the makings of our own hands, or the created order. But there's, a, there's ultimately a nameless anxiety of so many men today, and it testifies to their passive participation in the program of anti-theism. The more articulate speak of an abyss, that seems to have opened up with the heart of man. This anxiety and this abyss are precisely the nothingness out of which God has called each man into being and back to which man seems to fall when he denies God and in consequence denies his own creation and his own being. The sphere of falling out of being, as it were, is the most pervasive kind of nihilism today. And I would say that one of those things, again, yeah, life and existence, theater of the absurd. But I would say that that idea of falling out of being. I think that you're that people in a day and age, this, this nihilistic day and age and why it shall not win, in fact. Is because it cannot the 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 soul right within us, the fact that we have that dignity that comes with our being persons created in the image of God. The idea that we have a conscience, the idea that Christianity was so ingrained for so long, the idea that in the end it's going to lose. And that's even just for this world, like on this side of things, saying also right now, by the way, the Lord is reigning with all power and all authority in heaven and on earth at this exact moment. And that all of this is, in fact, part of his divine plan. He's not going to lose. He's not going to lose. And we shall not either, right? Insofar as we align ourselves with him, insofar as we subject ourselves to him, insofar as we give him thanks and the obedience that is necessary and due to him as our creator. We shall not lose. But there will be tremendous damage. And one of the things that's so damaging is not only the consequences in the future, but the tremendous loss of souls right now. And the malaise, adding insult to injury, the malaise that they're experiencing in these terrible and tumultuous days. In this secular age, this satanic secular age. We need to be there for them. We need to be there for them. And I hope that we can take things that we discuss on here. The, the small contributions I can make, if any, right? I follow in the footsteps of giants. I say... A lot of it is reading. I enjoy reading what they say. I've enjoyed applying it to my life. I've enjoyed, it's helped me to better understand the Lord. It's it's helped me better understand myself. And to understand how my experiences, even as an atheist, to have fallen into apostasy, to have have embraced, not even fallen, to run with Augusta, to run with Augusta, to embrace it with everything I had, 
to get onto the radio day after day after day and bash the living daylights out of the church, to bash the ever-living daylights out of the faith, to understand it. And to understand, why did I feel the cross pressures of that secular age? Why did I, why, how and why did I feel that? Why was it difficult to live on the one hand where I wanted to have children, I wanted to continue going on, even if just through the genes of things and the ideas of things, that continuity that comes with a covenant body, why did I still want that? And yet on the other hand, realizing that if I was to live and to move and to have my being in the way that atheism was, was more and more and more as the abyss, the mission creep of the abyss was spreading about, if it, it, the closer that got, the more that I rode that, the crazier and more absurd everything was and the more likely that it would have been. That even if it wasn't me, even if it didn't end with me because I had some kids, that it would likely end with my children. It's like Christmas. It really is. Like people who, and Christmas played a huge role, not only in my initial conversion, but in my return to the faith years later. To sit there and say, people, when they fall away into a secular age, into the, the annihilation, the self-annihilation, societal annihilation, spiritual, right, philosophical annihilation of the abyss of atheism, right, when they do that, they're running on steam. They, they may hold on to things from their life before that. But it's member berries. It's, it's nostalgia. The superorganism, the, the, the wicked superorganism of anti-theism will gobble that up. The pressures you will experience. And you can hold firm on that. But the truth is you can, you can still celebrate Christmas. Maybe you loved it. But one day your kids are going to ask you, why are we doing this? I like the presents, but why are we doing this? And why do I need to give presents to kids that I aborted out of existence when I was older? I guess I don't have any gifts to give. I contracepted them out, mom. I aborted them out, mom. I LGBTQIA'd and everything else, them out of existence, mom. So what's the point of that little manger anymore? It's the same thing with any tradition that you're holding fast to. It's holding, it, it, it's going to affect it. And it did me. And it was one thing after another, after another. And I thought, even if I were to hold fast to it, you can be a right wing atheist guy. Trust me, I know. You can live that way. But your kids won't. Or your children's children won't. And why? Unless, unless one of your children deviates from you, but then your ideas and what you were, that's gone, annihilated out, back to the stardust, eaten by some worms. It's tragic. But that's why God put us here. That's why God put us here. So we've got to make sure that we're doing our absolute best, our darndest every single day to give it all we've got and to realize that God wants to use you. God wants to use me, an imperfect vessel, acting kind of wild on a mic, right? Kind of goofy, kind of weird. Stutters and stammers sometimes goes over crazy articles at the beginning of shows and doesn't know where he left off and getting confused, making mistakes all the time here and there, but saying, you know what? I'm going to give it everything I got. And not just for myself. In the end, yes, I am going to have to stand before God. I, I have to. And I will. But I'm going to stand before God for what I did and didn't do. And a lot of the things that I do or do not do have to do not only with myself, but also with people and people just like you. And so I, I commit here to this and to say, I'm going to do Paleocrat Diaries. You can find out more, of course, paleocratdiaries.com. The real place. Patreon, of course, patreon.com slash Diaries, But also, of course, Telegram, t.me slash Diary or slash the Wolfpack Chat. <laughs> you can go t.me, the letter t.me slash the Wolfpack Chat. In fact, right now, I'm going to go over there right now. As soon as this is over, I'm going to go over there. I'll probably be around for about a half an hour. I'm going to do a live chat. Just chilling with the folks. 
coming up with different ideas, different ways that we can that we can get better all the time. And not just with arguments to download to the brain, but with stuff that radiates from the heart. And that's why we say never give up. That's why we say keep on smiling. That's why we say that one day we're going to die. And in the meantime, we got to dream bigger thoughts. That's why we say all those things. So meet me over there. I'd love to get to know you. And thank you for watching the show. Till next time, never give up. Keep on smiling. And momentum more. I wanted to make people dream bigger thoughts.